Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for being in the room. We've got a lovely big room. For those online, we're in the main room of the event. Um, we've got a lovely big room. We're going to move around later, so we're going we're gonna to take up the space and use it. Um, but it's great to see you, and thank you for coming. Um, I know there are other sessions. You've chosen this one. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being online. Thank you for waiting for us to start. Thank you to Jen Hoffman uh, for coordinating the event at the start, and to Veronica, Dorsa, Felicity, and Axel for bringing it all together in the last few weeks. The collaboration of SPHERE with International Union for Conservation of Nature and the IFRC is such an important one, and I'm really excited about where we go next. So next slide, please. Um, so the running order for today, um, in a minute, Veronica will just give a little overview of what are nature-based solutions. Then we're going to run a, a practical exercise, and then we're going to come up with some practical examples as well. Um, then we're going to take half an hour break, and we're going to come back at 11 o'clock um, for the second part of the session, where we have an amazing panel um, hosted by Veronica. So please do come back um, at 11 for that. And then the next slide, please. We're now just going to take a moment to remember our friend and colleague, Maher Alabrish. Maher was a dedicated and gifted humanitarian who worked for the FAO. He was a sphere trainer and a true champion. His unexpected passing last week has come as a shock, and it's an immense loss to the people he served in Syria, the Middle East, and the sector as a whole. We had the pleasure to meet Maher in person at HNPW last year. We'll remember him for his kindness, his sense of humor, and his consistent enthusiasm to volunteer. He was a panelist at this event last year, and he was gonna be here again um, supporting this event. So we miss him and we remember him. We just take a moment of silence um, to remember him. Thank you very much. So Sphere, Sphere and the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, I'll just say very quickly that, that Sphere has a handbook, you might have heard of it. It's not a rule book, and it's far more than a handbook. We are a network of champions, and in the, in the, the guide, we have the Humanitarian Charter, we have the core Humanitarian Standard, and we have minimum standards, which are meant to be contextualized. So without contextualizing this book in every location, um, it's not useful. So it's meant to be contextualized. And in many ways, it's like a lighthouse. It's not a threat. And these guidance documents are not here to hinder you, but they're like a torchbearer, a safeguard, and a guide. I now hand over to Veronica. Thank you, William, and good morning, everybody. Um, William just mentioned about the Sphere Handbook, and now we are jumping into Nature Resolution. So what's the link here? The link is uh, uh, the event we have last year in the room next to this one, where we uh, where we launched the uh, Sphere NBS Unpack Guide. And uh, I don't think I will tell you anything that you don't know yet. Nature Resolutions is now... Uh, one of the um, words in the humanitarian jargon too. This is um, a surprise. This is, uh, I think, also the result of the joint collaboration between environmental and humanitarian organization where the discourse has been changing from purely humanitarian jargon to bringing nature more prominently into the discourse. Yesterday, we have the annual meeting with the Hehan uh, uh, members, and it was surprising to see how in 2016, nature uh, and IUCN was a together with WWF, the only two organizations bringing nature into the table. And just yesterday was Nature Resolution was a cross-cutting theme for the network. So this is a, a big change in just uh, uh, over a little bit more than six years. It may look like it's a long time, but still. So Nature Resolutions uh, is 
let's say, tapping into the power of nature. It's not only using nature for the sake of nature, but really being able to think about like this symbiosis in between nature and people. We cannot consider nature on one side and people in the other side. We go hand by hand and we have interlinkages in between both people and nature because we live with nature and we live for people and for nature too. So nature based solutions were coined uh, early in the 2000s and IUCN together with many organizations we have been really describing the term. And it was back in 2016 that IUCN took the lead and um, adopt nature based solutions definition for the first time as part of our governance mechanism, the World Conservation Congress with more than 1000 members voting to have uh, this definition recognized. And this definition has been evolving over the years and it has been back in 2022 that finally nature based solutions were recognized under the UN system. This is a big achievement and we really recognize the effort made by the UNEP in making this definition adopted uh, under the UN system because now it will be the possibility really to catalyze action on the ground but also at the policy level which was uh, a missed opportunity. So I won't read the definition of nature based solution that you have here back in, in, the, in the screen, I could tell by heart, but really bear in mind that nature based solutions, they are not only actions, intervention uh, measures that provide, next slide please, that provide uh, benefit for, for, next please benefits only for biodiversity, but also benefits for people, as I was saying. Nature based solutions also provide benefits that are not monetized in terms of like cultural um, cultural benefits, like social cohesion. We also uh, providing uh, job creation and income generation. We have colleagues here from the International Labor Organization that have been doing this work in really uh, uh, showcasing how nature based solutions can really uh, be a source of uh, new uh, jobs. And most importantly, nature based solutions can be used as a tool for bringing policy coherence and alignment. We always talk about that we need to have a joint discourse. Nature based solutions can be the tool that can support in really building this joint narrative. And by saying this, I think I pass on to you, William. Okay, thank you so much, Veronica. <clears throat> We're now for the next few minutes gonna run um, what's known as an empathy narration exercise before we start to get into the unpacked guide. Um, so do get comfortable. Um, the empathy narration exercise is gonna take you back in time. And I've borrowed this from a friend of mine, unashamedly taken it. Um, and I went through this um, a couple of months ago and I found it really quite useful and helpful. If you can go on to the slide that has the, the black and white photos, which was uh, there at the beginning. So the 1931 Yangtze River floods were considered to be one of the most extensive and damaging natural disasters of the 20th century. As many as 50 million people were affected and an estimated 2 million people died as a direct result of the unprecedented flood. The winter of 3031 had been particularly harsh, leaving large deposits of snow and ice in the upper catchments of rivers. These frozen reservoirs melted in the spring and merged with unusually heavy rains, engorging rivers and lakes and raising the water table. In the summer, China experienced an extremely powerful monsoon. In an average year, the Yangtze Basin could expect maybe two cyclonic storms. And in 1931, there were seven in July alone. These storms dumped the equivalent of one and a half times the average annual volume of rain in just a single month. Now, the neglected hydraulic defenses that protected human communities living alongside, living alongside the Yangtze and Huai rivers stood little chance. The catastrophic flood that struck China in the summer of 31 was neither a natural nor a human-made disaster, it was both. And the ultimate cause of the flood lay in the long-term interaction between human communities and river basins, between people and nature. 
Flooding was and is a perennial problem faced by those in the Yangtze region. Agriculturalists exacerbated the natural risk of flooding by transforming the landscape. Excessive deforestation, wetland reclamation, and the overextension of river dike networks transformed regular flood pulses, which were an integral feature of the fluvial ecosystem, into destructive floods, which wrought chaos upon people. On August the 19th, 1931, water levels exceeded 16 meters, drowning 200,000 people. The immediate effects of the floods transformed the plains of the river basin into an area resembling a great lake the size of France. Now, while the immediate effects of the floods were disastrous, the secondary impacts were devastating. Floods completely washed away the region's rice paddies and agricultural fields, making an already impoverished nation more at risk of famine. Okay, so we've set the scene now. Wuhan is a famous city today, and we all know why. But 90 years ago, it was in the headlines of an epicenter of one of the worst floods in recorded history. We're going to suspend our own reality in this room for a second or online, and we're going to go back and try and get a glimpse of what it must have been like. So with transport cut off, waters rising, think of your own home. You start to consider your options. What things are you going to think of first? What do you think you'd have to save? your family, your possessions, maybe your pets. So I'm now going to ask you to join the narrative exercise. And some people find this better if you now close your eyes. It's just going to be a few minutes. There's no pressure to close your eyes. You don't have to do this at all. So the problems began in the spring as river water began pouring into the streets and mingled with effluent disgorged from overflowing sewers. Soon the whole city was permeated by a horrific stench, which only grew worse under the heat of the sun. Rickshaw pullers and other menial workers had to wade through filthy water to earn a living, while customers perched precariously on the awnings. And as the flood water crept higher, the streets were transformed into canals, a bit like Venice. Enterprising sampan owners who ordinarily scraped a living by ferrying cargo began renting out their boats as water taxis. Those who could not afford the, the fares took to the water in a flotilla of improvised vessels, rafts made from doors, inflated goat skins, wooden bathtubs. Some people emptied out coffins and used them as canoes. Now the flood may have been a disaster for people, but it created excellent ecological conditions for other species. Snakes, frogs, turtles, more and more fish swimming into the city, into homes. And some of these species were harmful to people. And mosquitoes and water snails thrived and causing epidemics of malaria and schistosomosis. In late July, the dikes that encircled Wuhan collapsed. The water that had been held back cascaded into the city at terrifying speed. Flood waves scored whole neighborhoods from the landscape. Thousands of people living in houses constructed from timber and earth were drowned or buried alive. Those who survived salvaged what they could. Now, preferably keeping your eyes closed, no pressure. Just call out, what are you hearing now? What sounds do you think you're hearing? Just shout it out. Doesn't matter if you say it at the same time, but what, what are you hearing? Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. And, and what are you smelling? What, is, what are the smells that are coming through to where you are? How is your body reacting to constant interaction with water for weeks turning into months? There's no way you can properly dry anything. How's that making you feel? Yeah.
Yeah. I'm going to continue a bit longer now. So as the value of dry space increased, hoteliers tripled rates, packing the high rooms well beyond capacity. Buildings started to collapse under this additional weight. Electricity was not the only amenity lost to the floods. Telegraph office, telephone exchange, airport, the railway lines were all forced to close, and they stayed shut or closed for weeks, turning into months. Thousands of refugees were living on the railway embankments. The sewage system emptied the bowels into the streets. Residents were in the grip of an unprecedented health crisis. Thousands would succumb to dysentery, cholera, and other waterborne diseases. The IDPs did not just rely upon the assistance of benevolent elites. Like most people affected by disaster, they took responsibility for their own survival. In rural areas, those who had lost their farms foraged for aquatic plants such as lotus, water chestnuts, wild rice. In Wuhan and other villages, people survived by catching fish. Now, the local military were convinced that communists were using the refugee crisis as a pretext to infiltrate Wuhan. They declared martial law, began patrolling the streets with mounted machine guns on boats. Anyone suspected of looting was executed on the spot. But even such draconian treatment could not quell the paranoia, and eventually the soldiers expelled refugees from the city center at gunpoint, relocating them to ill-prepared camps on the outskirts of Wuhan, where thousands would die from disease in these camps. Chiang Kai-shek was an eyewitness. Words can hardly depict the feelings of oppression and poignant agony which filled me when I witnessed with my own eyes the scenes of death and desolation, of the excruciating suffering of the injured, the famished, and those living torn asunder from their friends and their relatives. So for the last time, with your eyes maybe still closed, you're on the top floor of your house. You've managed to survive for weeks, the water occasionally reaching even the top floor. And often you have to get onto a chair or a table or the bed get out of the water. And then this person who was there, Chiang Kai-shek, he comes past your bedroom window in a boat. He calls out to you, are you okay? Can I help you? What do you reckon you'd say? What do you reply? Okay, well, thank you for joining in that. I'm just going to finish now with the, f the final conclusion before we hand over to Felicity in the room and Axel online to guide us through the next stage. So open your eyes, come back into the room. Now, much of the damage caused by that flood could have been avoided if flood control measures were followed closely. At the time of the floods, most of China's resources were being put towards a, a civil war. Therefore, sediment built up along the riverbanks and the Yangtze was in inevitably neglected. The river basins have now increased their resilience to flooding through rainwater interception and st stormwater management systems, constructed wetlands to help treat runoff and improve water quality. And these have also acted as nat natural flood barriers. Water regulation structures such as levees and interconnected storage lakes and a wastewater collection network that operates separately from the stormwater collection has also been established. Now, through promoting integrated river basin management, including the ecological water management, the Chinese have also adjusted the cropping systems to the changed climate. They're protecting natural forests much more. They're reducing the human impacts on the alpine grasslands on the upper slopes. They're restoring wetlands, and they're promoting low carbon development. These, na these nature-based solutions have been essential in managing the recent floods. And on page 58, page 59, in part four of the guide, you can see a lot of these 
um, nature-based solutions as practical examples. Now, these na nature-based solutions have to be locally led. They have to be locally led by the community. So in conclusion, then, it's not just a question of whether we can work with nature. It's a matter of we have to. We have stripped away our forests. We've intensively grown monocrops. We've changed river courses and poured into them deadly chemicals which are going to echo through the coming generations. We've watched as jungle and grassland have turned to desert. We've seen millions and millions and millions of tons of topsoil washed away, silted up natural defenses, silted up into the seas. We've built dams and then we've mismanaged them to the point of collapse. Libya, Kenya, Brazil, just three recent examples, and I won't go on, but we could talk about our oceans, our glaciers, the air that we breathe. So humanitarians, just like the rest of the world, we can't dither or wring our hands in the face of such destruction because we have no planet B either. And as I said last year at this event, I said to be a humanitarian now is to be an environmentalist. In fact, it's to be a climate chaos activist. It's not an optional extra. But the good news is we have hundreds of success stories and examples and guidance where we're beginning to turn things around. But we've all got to do more because we're on the wrong side of history when it comes to passing on to the next generation this fragile earth. Okay, I'll stop there and I'll now hand over to Felicity and Axel. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, William. Um, so now we're going to move to the practical part of this session. Um, and this is where you're going to get involved. Uh, as William said, we, we have guidance, we have tools to help us um, tackle this kind of situation. And so the purpose of this next part of the session is to explore the guidance in more detail. So what we've done is we have developed a scenario, a flooding scenario, and we're going to ask you to work on that scenario in smaller groups to design a humanitarian response to the scenario which takes into account nature-based solutions. Um, so we're going to work on four aspects of the scenario which relate to the four technical chapters of the Sphere Handbook. So one group is going to work on food and nutrition, one on shelter, one on health, and one on wash, thank you. Um, but you're not gonna be on your own. We have our collective intelligence. I'm sure there's a lot of experience in the room in these subjects, but we also have four uh, very kind uh, facilitators from Sphere um, who are going to help. So um, I'd like to, where is Vanda? Thank you, Vanda. Uh, Vanda is going to help the group working on the shelter aspect of the scenario, finding nature-based solutions to design the humanitarian response around shelter. This is Vanda, everybody. Um, and we also have Aisha, Thank you, Aisha, who joins us from CWSA in Pakistan. I, I won't introduce you, Vanda, because you're going to introduce yourself properly later. Uh, but Aisha joins us from Pakistan, and she is going to be working on, with you on the health aspect of the response, incorporating nature-based solutions. Um, and we also have Yaman, who joins us from Syria, who will be helping work on the WASH aspect. Um, and that leaves us with Alistair, uh, there, um, who is going to be working on the food and nutrition group. So please remember, you have these sphere resource people to help you work on your technical uh, aspect of the response. You also have this guide, and there are a lot of answers in this guide. You also have the collective intelligence of this room. So please, work as a group to find solutions. Um, so please join the group that you feel you most want to work on. Um, you're going to work across the whole of the disaster management 
uh, cycle. So you're going to be working from preparedness to resilience building. Um, so please join a group. And I think there are around 24 of us. Uh, there are four groups. So there should be about six people in each group. So try and spread yourselves out uh, evenly. And you have 30 minutes. So please get working, get going. And Axel, can you give us a wave, Axel? OK, Axel is going to be doing a similar exercise online with our online participants. Axel, would you like to add anything before we get going? I'm not sure if we can hear you. Let's try if you can hear me. Hello, welcome yes, we everybody. Can hear you. Yeah, please online say a few words, and in Axel. Geneva. Yeah, I, I wanted to remember us again, you know, um, maybe uh, some surprises are coming up. And as Felicity said, we have uh, 30 minutes to work. We really need your energy in the room and also online. And we want you to listen, of course, with your ears to the great ideas we are collecting. But we are all humanitarians, so we also have to listen with our hearts. Maybe you are able to uh, put a smile on the face of your um, colleagues, and maybe there are some surprises uh, for us and good solutions. And in the end, you know, um, it's about the right to life with dignity. It's about all of us, nothing about us without us. It's about people. And we as people are also, of course, part of nature. So that's the spirit for the group work. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Axel. We will see you in about half an hour. And I hope I'm now mute for Geneva and I can just talk to the people who are online. Uh, hi, Axel. Yes, all is good. Okay. Um, I really hope nobody's hearing me now in Geneva. I'm just <laughs> scared of that. So, Tilina, I can see you. So, I'm assuming uh, that you can hear me, right, Tilina? And I would like to give you the scenario because I already put you in breakouts, but I would like to read out um, the scenario for you. So, I want to share my screen. And hopefully um, you can see the screen, but I will read out the little scenario. It's not too long. So uh, we are... I think it's good that we see what the... Say again? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Axel. Perfect. Sorry for the confusion but doing it in a hybrid way <laughs> yes. there's always some struggle it's okay. uh, great just fyi we are all uh, also able to share see your screen on the uh, big screen here so there is a little bit of you know back and forth between the online presence and offline um on-site presence <laughs> no problem so what's the situation where are you with your organization so you are at sea view and sea view it's a picturesque coastal community and it's struggling with the aftermath of a severe flooding that was triggered by a cyclone. The flooding has resulted in significant damage to infrastructure, displacement of families, and disruption of essential services. As a humanitarian responder, your team has been deployed to provide immediate humanitarian assistance and to add value to existing capacities and implement sustainable solutions to address the ongoing issues. Okay, so that's basically the scenario. We just have a, a setting after a cyclone uh, coastal area. And what I will do, I will put you into eight breakout rooms. And each of the breakout room, um, the number that you're having is by coincidence uh, also related to one of the slides on a gem board. So, um, if you are in group number one, you're on Jamboard slide of which number? Can somebody help me? 
Yes, Jen, one. one. If you're on breakout four, you're on which slide? I think we got that. That's perfect. So um, I'm just sharing in the chat um, the link of the Jamboard. And what you need to do is please open the link already. Uh, because once you're on the breakout, you will have problems accessing it. I will repeat that um, link again. And on each of the Jamboard, you also have a short description um, of uh, the scenario. And in um, breakout one or two, you're dealing with wash, water, sanitation, and hygiene promotion, and so forth. Three and four, food security and nutrition. And it's also, again, relating to um, the technical chapters of Sphere. So your task is um, you have 30 minutes and please try to identify solutions um, to your response setting and please take into account a nature-based solution. Think of the capacity of the people, think of experience. And I also share two links. It's the online version of the Sphere Handbook. And it also has a very good um, online search function. And you also have a link to the PDF of the nature-based solution. But the main thing to us is that you link, learn, and connect. And you use the Jamboard, and you pin on or you write on the solutions that you're having. We want you to have an engaging discussion. Try to think out of the box. Use the capacity of the people. Use the experience and try to find the best solutions for your specific technical chapter. You think that's OK uh, to understand, Jen? Um, some of us will hop around the breakout rooms, try to support you. Um, but I'm sure um, you can link, learn, and connect uh, with each other easily. So I'll put you in the breakout. Now it's only 26 minutes because I talked too long. And enjoy the discussion. Feel free to uh, meet each other and see you shortly. Axel, I just want to check. I'm not sure if everybody's seen that the, the links to the Jamboard that you've sent. Are they in the chat? Yeah, they're in the chat. Okay, so I'm not sure if folks can see those. So why don't I go ahead and paste those in on my end too? Just double. Yes, up. please. Okay. Thank you. We might need just to pop into the various rooms as well to share those yeah, people. We will in. do that. Thank you. Just adding the newly joined people to the specific rooms. Axel, because I'm not co-host, okay, I am. Um, 
I can't hop from room to room, but I'm wondering if people need the link. So yeah, I put you... it in every room. I, I put everything again in every room. It should be there. Perfect. Great. Um, okay. But I can make you co-host, I think. Excellent. Do you need any support? And if so, what can I do?
Hi there. Um, have you just joined us? We're in a breakout room session, and we can we can uh, uh, slot you into your room if you'd like. That. That. Hi, Antonella. Um, I saw you in a room before. Um, do you want to go back to the room or just stay in the, um, how would you call that? Uh, outside of well, the, break? the thing is that I was in the break room, somebody was speaking and suddenly everybody disappeared one after the other one. And that's why I left because I was alone on the break, in the break room. And, and Antonella, uh, um, somebody else just asked to go back into room five as well. So you shouldn't be alone, I think, if you go back in now. Yeah, and I know. I stayed there for a while, and how do I go back? I can, or somebody can put you back. Give me a second. Which was your number? Number five. Number five. Okay, I have to find you. Jen. Antonella, okay. Okay, thanks. Number five. It wouldn't allow me because I think the room is, nobody's in there. Well, that's the thing. I was the last one to leave, but I don't okay, know what so, happened because so somebody was to... talking. There was a technical problem. So uh, somebody was speaking and then uh, that person disappeared and then one by one, they all disappeared. Sorry. <laughs> I yeah, I was, I was also there, but I just got disconnected as well. Um, I just tried to get back in. But... Okay. Okay. I know that <laughs> no, my, no, my colleague, uh, Nicola, is in room number two and they had a discussion and they had a good atmosphere. So do you mind if I put you on two? Antonella oh, and yeah, why not? What are they doing in two? It's like I'll check later. Um, they are in wash. Okay. How much longer do we have for the breakout rooms? <laughs> um, maybe yes. eight minutes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I we can just 
join yeah. join some other discussion, I guess. I don't know what happened to the other three. I just got disconnected. Yeah, yeah. I also don't know. I'm sorry for that. Okay, I put you into room number Never mind. Yeah. two. Okay. Sounds good. And who was the other person? I can... Me, Cecilia. Ah, Cecilia, sorry. It's too many screens. <laughs> I'm always happy to facilitate in a room, but not in a virtual one. Okay, I put you into room number two, Cecilia. Thank you. Thank you. you. There we go. Thanks, Axel. I did put them back into room five a few times, but whatever reason, room five just keeps bumping people out. So great you did that. Yeah, that's how it that's is. But the wonders of technology. <laughs> but that's okay. I think we're all used to that. And there were some discussions going on. People met. That's all good. Yeah. And Doris is just a, a gentle reminder that um, to wrap up in about seven minutes. So I'll just let her know that we're on track. Uh, yes, thank you. So, oh. Oh, hi. Yeah. I, I just I have one ear in. Um, so yes, I think in about uh, by ten o five, uh, I think we should uh, come back to plenary. Uh, yeah. The reporting but back. Yeah. By by coincidence, I I reduced the time in the breakout. I think more or less exactly. So they're closing automatically okay, in seven minutes, fourteen perfect. seconds. Perfect. Uh, we will like in a couple of minutes start to ask people uh, on site to you know go back to their seats. <laughs> yeah. In Germany, we say the luck is with the stupid. <laughs> okay. Hello, Annika and Dennis. I can see that probably you had an internet problem and now you're back to the plenary. Do you want me to put you back in a room? We still have six minutes. For my part, thanks. You know, I, I will wait for the... Um... That's fine. I think that's the perfect time that you can use for coffee. Hi, Catherine Numa. I just saw that you're back in the plenary. There's another five minutes. Um, do you want me to put you in a group? Hi, hello, Masanang. Um, there's another five minutes of group work. Do you want me to put you in one of the groups? Cannot see you, Anika, Masanang, and Dennis. Um, but there's uh, four minutes to go. If you still want to join a group, feel free. Hello, also Abdul. Um, there's another four minutes. Um, and Sarah, if you want me to put you in a group um, that you can follow the discussion, please put a thumbs up or open your mic. Otherwise, we will be back in the plenary in uh, less than four minutes, which might give you time to grab something to eat and drink.
if you want to open the mic, it's also fine because what I learned is that the plenary in Geneva cannot hear us and we can have a conversation. If you uh, want thanks. To. I'll just wait for the plenary. I wanted to hear the results from the breakout. Yeah, okay. It's it's coming. Hopefully. <laughs> okay. If they have done anything, we don't know, you know, we are online. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, right now, uh, uh, we are not sharing the audio from Zoom uh, with the on-site participants, but later on, uh, we will like just you know, put yes. it back on. Yeah. Yeah. So we have two and a half minutes to um, to have a conversation. So feel free because <laughs> um, this is also about link, learn and connect, meeting each other, listening to each other. So um, I know that Mas Anang is here. Yeah, as you can see, uh, online participants, uh, sorry, on-site participants are slowly moving back to okay. their chairs. So, Yeah, the um, the online breakouts will stop in 2 minutes, 20 seconds. Okay. And I'm sure the room is very nice and big, but it doesn't feel exactly the same like sitting under a nice mango tree and smelling the fruits, listening to the birds and getting a breeze of the wind in your hair, but rather looks uh, like really a nice um, office building. Come back. I mute myself now as well. Definitely the advantage of Zoom, you know, if group work stopped, you just click a button and everybody's back and they are struggling now in Geneva, I think.
Y no entiendo. Hi everyone. If you could um, take your seats again, please. I know there's a lot of discussion going on, <laughs> but we need to move on with our agenda. Definitely the advantage we are having online. Okay, um, thank you everybody for taking part uh, in that mini workshop. And I know that there was absolutely not enough time um, and there was plenty more to discuss. So, you know, this is the start of our journey together, not the end, uh, but I think we made a very good start and thank you all for sharing your expertise, uh, but also digging into uh, the guide in a bit more detail. And we will write up uh, the results of your flip charts and we will share them on the Sphere website. So your work is not lost and it will be built upon um, as we go forward. So thank you very much. And I hope you had a good um, time online, Axel. Any, anything to report from your online session? Yeah, maybe we can hear later from one of the groups because I can see that slide uh, number one, for example, is plastered with good ideas and solutions. Okay, great, thank you. And we will incorporate that into our write-up of this workshop. So uh, we have another 20 minutes uh, before we will have a half hour break. Um, so yeah, we just need your attention for another 20 minutes. And what we would like to do now is to look at some actual examples um, of projects that have incorporated nature-based solutions into their programming. So we have three very, very, very quick case studies to share with you. Um, so I'm going to ask Vanda Lenkong from Plan International to come up and share very quickly four slides um, about a project that is underway in Timor-Leste. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Vanda Lengkong from Plan International, and thank you to the group of Shelter, who uh, really very uh, great in sharing the uh, insight as well as the, uh, the discussion when we are using this one into the Shelter. So thank you very much. Very quickly, uh, from Plan International, we basically use this guide when uh, we are designing the, the project that uh, we are done with, uh, funded by um, DFAT, Australian uh, government in uh, Timor-Leste, because I come from the Asia-Pacific region. Okay. Not that. Next slide, please. Ah, okay. So the, the, the project is um, uh, really focusing on uh, strengthening community resilience and bringing the uh, the gender the gender lens which we are empowering women and youth through climate smart regenerative agriculture water sources management and and livelihood so this project is ongoing now in timor leste uh, targeting two area which is in rural um, uh, area and what we did is basically we try to kind of like integrate uh, livelihood, food and water security, and addressing also gender equality through three main components, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Number one is about climate smart regener regenerative agriculture, as you can able to see on the screen. Um, I will not go through in detail, but just to zooming in on the achievement and the progress. So we discuss and we support the community in increase their technical knowledge among the farmers in applying uh, organic fertilizer, cover cropping, uh, including terracering, because the, the, the target location is uh, vulnerable to flood and um, uh, to flood one more, uh, cyclone as well. Um, and also we, we uh, really work with the, uh, the farmer to also improve their um, livelihood. And then uh, when they, you know, the, the, the product of the agriculture like vegetables, we also sell it into the local market, facilitate them to sell into the local market so they can get uh, also income for, uh, for them. Next slide, please. And one more thing, it's also linking with the uh, school feeding program. 
So when the uh, the teacher uh, using the school feeding, they use uh, the vegetables from uh, the agriculture um, uh, project. Uh, sorry, activities uh, that we we support. Second is related with water resource management. Uh, again, because it is in the mountains area, so more and more uh, we create a water user group for those who wash uh, expert, uh, which is uh, having a woman and uh, a youth representative in this group. Um, we also making sure that um, we empower them. Uh, we also in involve people with disability into this, uh, into this group. And you can able to uh, uh, see what the specific uh, intervention and progress that we did under the water resource management. And final point on livelihood uh, improvement. So it is basically linked from point one and point two. Uh, we established community owned financial services like village saving and loan association, which is led by community. We discuss even in my group on shelter, how important of engaging a local community uh, into the um, NBS uh, activity. So we have this concrete example in Timor-Leste and it is really uh, creating livelihood opportunity uh, to, the, um, to the people. And my final slide, please, next slide. Uh, when talking about, about this guide, and Veronica mentioned this in um, her slide uh, before, what we can able to, to tell from the design of the project, uh, the way that we adopt the approach in Timor-Leste, at least in the four main components. Number one is empowering women and youth. Secondly is climate smart regenerative agriculture, water resource management, and livelihood improvement, which is integrated. Uh, specifically focusing on the preparedness side because the project is the disaster risk reduction uh, example. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanda. We did say that would be quick, uh, but you will have the opportunity to talk to Vanda in the break. So if you have any questions for Vanda at 10.30, go and grab her. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, now our next speaker for another very quick presentation. Um, do we have Michael Yu Kisong here? Ah, oh, okay, Michael, please come and tell us. Um, you're from ILO and you're going to talk to us about a project in Kenya. And if you say next slide, hopefully, there we go. Uh, yes, and I'm doing this together with my colleague Lillian, actually, who is in Kenya running the project. So I hope she is able to come in. Um, so I'm from the ILO, International Labor Organization, and generally we are interested in nature-based solutions, both what new jobs can be created through the implementation of nature-based solutions, but also how nature-based solutions can improve the productivity or the quality of existing jobs. So there's two angles we take to this. Um, and we also apply this in the context of um, jobs for Refugees, which is what this project in Kenya is about, which is a, a project to, to support um, refugees and host communities in Kenya, um, including with livelihoods and income. So with that, I'm going to, if possible, hand over to Liliane if she's there. Yes, I'm here, Michael. Okay, so please go ahead, Liliane. Thank you. Uh, good uh, morning from Nairobi. Uh, um, it's my pleasure to make this presentation to you this morning. Uh, could you scroll to the next slide, uh, please? So I, I'll basically be sharing about uh, what ILO, how ILO is uh, applying nature-based uh, solutions in a forced displacement uh, context. Uh, I'm sharing about a program that's funded by the government of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, uh, operating or rather being implemented in the refugee hosting uh, counties in Kenya. Um, the program goal is to explore um, uh, prospects for host communities and uh, forcibly displaced persons and uh, promote social economic uh, inclusion of refugees and host communities. Uh, Kenya has hosted uh, refugees for over 30 years now. And uh, traditionally the approach was uh, purely humanitarian, but uh, over the years with the recognition of uh, 
insufficient resources to sustain this approach, uh, more developmental approaches are, have been uh, promoted. And ILO is one of the organizations that uh, champions uh, the link between humanitarian and development uh, nexus uh, in the refugee hosting areas in Kenya. Specifically, we uh, explore finding local solutions and that can lead to jobs creation, targeting both refugees and host communities. And in this program, we are working with other partners like UNHCR, the World Bank, IFC, and UNICEF, all promoting uh, social economic inclusion for refugees and host communities, but leading on uh, different uh, uh, components of the program. For example, UNICEF and UNHCR child protection and, and general uh, protection for the displaced persons. The World Bank, IFC, and ILO tend to focus more of the developmental approaches and uh, championing uh, economic uh, development and jobs creation in the uh, local uh, contexts. Next, please. I'm going to briefly talk about uh, our key intervention areas, which are around education and training. Uh, access to skills for the labor market, but also uh, strongly pushing uh, recognition for prior learning, because like you might know, displaced persons come uh, with skills that are not necessarily uh, recognized in their host countries, and therefore recognition of prior learning is one key uh, outcome of our work, which is helping refugees uh, be integrated in the uh, local labor markets. Uh, of course, we have a big uh, pillar on employment and livelihoods in dignity, uh, promoting access to decent jobs for both refugees and host communities using the different uh, ILO tools that I will uh, not go into depth with on uh, because of the limited time that we have. And of course, promotion, inclusion of refugees and uh, other forcibly displaced persons in the national development plans, but also access to the existing national uh, protect, social protection uh, schemes that are available in the, in the country. Uh, next, Michael. Uh, the reason that I'm running through this is so that I get to the nature-based solution that we are working on in the, in the context uh, in Kenya. And uh, one of those is the uh, promoting management of the uh, Prosopis juriflora, which is a invasive plant, which is common in the refugee hosting uh, communities. It's invasive, but it also has um, a benefit to the community in terms of uh, pro uh, good in uh, soil and retention, but also preventing erosion. So that that's the uh, purpose for which the uh, plant was introduced in this context. However, with time, it's become extremely invasive and covers a lot of uh, ranch lands, a lot of farmlands, and that the government of Kenya has uh, developed a prosopis management uh, strategy, which we are supporting to implement by uh, uh, utilizing prosopis, this uh, invasive plant, to uh, create uh, products and services that can be used by both refugees and host communities. Now, this range from poles for construction to uh, uh, fuel uh, for cooking uh, to even uh, uh, honey, which is coming from the the uh, the leaves of the of the prosopis uh, plant. So. It's a strategy for promoting management of the invasive uh, uh, plant, but by utilization. We are in partnership with the Kenya Forest Research Institute uh, and the local governments in the refugee hosting areas. We are in partnership also with the Kenya Industrial Research and Development Institute and a local university, the Garissa University. Next, please. The idea is that we uh, support and train communities to manage the, the invasive plant, but also uh, build the capacity of the local government institutions to be able to uh, manage the plant uh, 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 by utilizing it. So uh, developing adequate and uh, appropriate legal frameworks to allow communities to access the plant for 
wh whether it's for um, uh, high value uh, products and value addition to make things like animal feed to make uh, products like uh, the wood uh, products that I've just mentioned. But also in other cases, we promote uh, clearing of the plant and uh, replacing that with high value indigenous plants or other uh, high value plants like bamboo and fruit trees. And uh, I'm just mentioning some of the key activities that we have supported because the impact of this is then it provides uh, local communities with uh, livelihoods options. It creates uh, jobs in the different value chains, whether it's animal feed, whether it's fuel production, whether it's manufacturing of wood uh, products, uh, that supporting uh, enterprises that are whose raw material is really the soap is uh, during fall. We are then uh, linking these communities who get jobs out of the plant to uh, services like business development services, financial services access and markets access, and ultimately also social protection systems so that they uh, develop and sustain their livelihoods out of that. Um, Great. Uh, thank, thank you, Lillian. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Um, that was a brilliant, fascinating presentation about incorporating nature-based solutions and enhancing livelihoods um, in Kenya. So thank you very much. And again, Michael is here, I hope for a few minutes in the break, if anyone has any further questions. So moving on to our final speaker of this first half, um, Anais Mathi Juno um, is going to talk to us about um, a nature-based solutions project in Mozambique. Uh, joining us from IOM, I think online. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. There you go. Five minutes. Um, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me online as well. Uh, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to talk a little bit about our um, Nature Based Solutions pilot uh, with IOM in Mozambique. Um, next slide, please. So um, actually, uh, displacement uh, settings in Mozambique are, are quite different. Um, in the north, we have more um, conflict-related displacement. And in the central area, we have um, a lot of um, displacement related to, to disasters, uh, including several cyclones. You might, be, um, you might remember uh, Cyclone Idai, uh, Kenet, Eloise, um, and others since 2019. So our pilot uh, is um, in the province of Sovala um, that you can see here that is still hosting a lot of um, IDPs in resettlement sites. So for uh, longer term um, resettlement um, in this area. And everything started with our project that is uh, supported by Innovation Norway and also NORCAP. Um, we have worked there on the energy access uh, challenge um, as part of the humanitarian innovation program. Uh, and while looking at uh, energy needs, uh, energy need for um, lighting, energy for cooking, uh, we have uh, come to um, find a partner, Sequest Capital, a carbon developer, who has been helping us um, realize that there are other ways um, and kind of synergies that can be found uh, when looking at, looking at energy access. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, most people cook with with firewood and and three stones. Um, so it's it's very intensive um, in terms of impact uh, on on the environment. And uh, Sequest Capital's approach uh, is very holistic and looks at actually not only how to um, in, um, implement uh, improved cook stoves and through carbon financing as well, but really looking at a, a holistic approach and looking at how natural natural resources um, can be also protected, restored, um, and sustainably harvest, where, especially when it comes to um, the wood that I was just explaining. We have a picture of the, the design of the improved cook stoves um, here that are combined with some technologies that I'm happy to um, to explain a little bit uh, for anyone who uh, wants to join me in the break. Um, so yeah, here we're really looking at um, how um, this uh, nature-based solution component uh, was helping to really have uh, a more, um, I will say again, holistic, but I would say uh, in, a, in order to really restore and look at the landscapes um, rather than just, you know, um, trying to reduce um, uh, wood consumption. Next slide, please. 
So what we did just very briefly, the first steps, and that's maybe interesting for um, practitioners and, and people who who want to know how to start. Um, we, we worked with uh, Sequest Capital. They had a, a technical um, lead uh, on NBS and we started with uh, participatory risk um, and landscape appraisal. So you can see some pictures we, we mapped um, you know, over the year, what are their uh, act agricultural practices. Uh, they also used a map on the right side. You see um, mapping their own site, where are the resources, where are the water points, how far are you know their like their livelihoods and um some of the um, the things that could be leveraged um also in terms of mapping of the species species, what kind of trees, what kind of vegetation we have, and where maybe are some of the vulnerabilities and places with, that are more exposed um for this. Um, so that was the kind of the start. Um uh, next slide please. And after anal uh, analyzing these landscape and, and these risks, um, there were two different uh, activities that were recommended. The first one is the intercropping um, with maize and other um, you know, uh, crops that people are already um, uh, cultivating um, for their, for their self-subsistence. Um, and we, they tried to intercrop with uh, a, a local um, indigenous species that is called Tiferosia vogeli, uh, that is actually helping with nitrogen fixing the soil and also can become, once it, it grows, um, a source for fuel wood because then you can use this fuel wood um, in your improved cook stove so that you don't have to go and harvest far away. And the second um, activity that um, that was piloted there is uh, the biopesticide. It uh, we trained several farmers on how to produce biopesticide with uh, um, uh, like different like garlic and and soap and and water and so a mix of things that are locally available. Um, and I think that's it. I don't know if I have a last slide. <laughs> I think that's the last one. It was so it was just to next slide, please to see if there is one. I think that's it, yeah. Thank you so much. Um... Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for that example. And thank you everybody for all the practical examples you've given us this morning of nature-based solutions. Please join us in 30 minutes where we're gonna talk about the other important subject, which is scaling this up going from individual examples to how do we do this at scale. So please join us again in 30 minutes, but enjoy your break. Thank you.